The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. The last forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we will be looking at the central expectation of the entire Bible and of creation itself, redemption. Indeed, all of the Bible can be summarized by its blueprint of creation, fall, redemption, and return. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that although we started out as having been separated by sin, and we have left you to pursue our own righteousness, you have not left us. While we have been unfaithful, you are faithful always to seek and to save the lost. I pray that through this study your spirit would be present to draw, to convict, to redeem, and to seal those who would receive your gift of grace, hope, and abundant life through faith in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Of the many questions which man has pondered throughout time, surely one of, if not the most earnest quests, has been to answer the question, Is there a God? Who is He? What is His name? And how do we serve and please Him? And one way or another, virtually everyone will ask this question, whether the search for the answer is brief and superficial, or exhaustive and thorough, there are ultimately only three answers which we can arrive at. 1. There is no God. 2. There is a God. And 3. I don't know. In this episode we will begin with the premise that there is a God. Having said this, many will anticipate the next logical step, which is to identify who or what God is. As long as God remains nebulous, nonspecific, and generic, the majority of people are comfortable with the concept of God, because in this context, man can make God whatever they want God to be for them. It is only when God has been identified that the problems begin. Once God is established and identified, the decision must be made to either obey or disobey him, to submit to his will, or to rebel against it. Once the attempt is made to identify God, 
One of the frequent refrains I have heard over the years is that there are hundreds, indeed thousands, of religions which can claim to be the quote-unquote true religion, the quote-unquote way to salvation and or quote-unquote heaven. Skeptics often say that each religious adherent believes fervently that they have quote-unquote the truth and that the others are wrong. So the skeptic asks, what makes Christianity different? What makes it special? Well, it's a fair question and one that deserves a serious answer because either there is an ultimate truth and authority which exists, an ultimate authority giver, God, or there is none. All religions cannot be right because most, if not all, hold mutually contradictory views of who God is, man's relationship to him, and how salvation and or heaven are achieved, assuming the religion in question believes in these concepts at all. As man examines the claims of these various philosophical and religious systems, one must again inevitably ask, what makes Christianity different? If we assume there is an omniscient and omnipowerful God who created all things, including man, then we may also assume that God would anticipate communicating with his creation, as well as his desire of his creation, man, to seek out and communicate with him. We can also assume that God would anticipate that some men would easily have faith and others would have great difficulty believing God. We can also assume that God, in fact, would anticipate some having doubt in God. Ultimately, we can assume and anticipate that God would design his creation in a way by which every man who sincerely and honestly seeks God might discover the essential truth and reality of God in such a way that no one would find excuse. We would then expect to find methods by which God is communicating with his creation man in a way which contains its own objective empirical evidence incorporated into the message system involved by which each man can measure its inherent accuracy. If these assumptions are true, we would then expect that theoretically, potentially all that exists before mankind contains some information which exhibits evidence tantamount to the fingerprints or signature, if you will, of its creator, God. Our job is to open our eyes, minds, and hearts, examine and consider the evidence, be willing to make a conclusion, and live our lives accordingly. By way of disclaimer, those who truly understand and live the merits of Christianity understand, know, and believe with all due respect that Christianity stands above all religions since it ultimately is a relationship with Jesus Christ who is alive forever. This is distinctly different from many religions which are ultimately philosophical systems of belief or are derived from founders who themselves were merely human. Nevertheless, in an effort to remain fair to the sense of apologetics regarding Christianity, we need to discuss and understand the merits of our argument so as to be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that lies within us. In order to evaluate the merits of Christianity, like any other similar religious system, we need to consider what criterion would serve as a litmus test to determine and evaluate the veracity of the claims. For the purpose of this study, I propose three basic tests to determine the veracity of Christianity. 1. Source documents, including a. Textual analysis, integrity, and reliability, b archaeological conformity and reliability, c, prophetical content and reliability, and d, the effect on people's lives short and long term. 2. The founder, including a, claims, b, clarity and consistency of the message, c, conformity of the life to the message, and d, the veracity or reliability. 3. The claims and tenets including A, the clarity, B, the consistency, and C, the veracity. Finally, 4, secular history. Let's examine the above briefly. 1. Source documents. Insofar as comparative religion is concerned, when we talk about source documents, what we are talking about is a central written document, if applicable, which articulates the central views, doctrines, tenets, and theology of the religious system in question. 
In the case of Christianity, our source document would be the Bible. In this episode, I will be skipping any extended discussion of the Bible as a source document since I have already studied the issue in a prior episode. For those interested, I would direct you to the three-part episode on the subject entitled, The Bible, A Message from God to Man. 2. The Founder Again, insofar as comparative religion is concerned, when we talk about the founder, what we are talking about is the biographical quotations, the overall life history of the uh, central person or persons who are responsible for beginning and or founding the religious system in question. In the case of Christianity, the founder is unquestionably Jesus of Nazareth. This will be the focus of this episode, which I will have more to say about in a moment. 3. The claims and tenets. Insofar as comparative religion is concerned, when we talk about the claims and tenets, what we are talking about is the historical, archaeological, theological, and eschatological statements and narratives as detailed in the source documents by its founder or by its adherents. In the case of Christianity, we will limit our discussion of the claims and tenets of Christianity to those which regard the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Finally, for secular history. Insofar as comparative religion is concerned, when we talk about secular history, what we are talking about are those sources of information such as history and or archaeology outside and apart from the source documents, usually found in secular formats. Let's start with the discussion of number four, secular history. Since Jesus is the central figure and founder of Christianity, we need to better understand who Jesus is, what he accomplished, and why he is important. By way of summary from the world's secular standpoint, according to Wikipedia, quote, Jesus, also referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, is the central figure of Christianity. Most Christian denominations hold Jesus to be the Son of God. Christianity holds Jesus to be the awaited Messiah of the Old Testament and refers to him as Jesus Christ, a name that is also used in non-Christian contexts. Virtually all modern scholars of antiquity agree that a historical Jesus existed. Most scholars agree that Jesus was a Jewish teacher or a rabbi from Galilee who was baptized by John the Baptist and was crucified in Jerusalem on the orders of the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate. Scholars have constructed various portraits of the historical Jesus which often depict him as having one or more of the following roles. The leader of an apocalyptic movement, Messiah, a charismatic healer, a sage, or a philosopher. Christians believe that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, performed miracles, founded the church, died by crucifixion as a sacrifice to achieve atonement, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven from which he will return. The great majority of Christians worship Jesus as the incarnation of God the Son, the second of three persons of a divine trinity. Biblical scholars and classical historians regard theories of his non-existence as effectively refuted." Unquote. Nevertheless, let us examine the various secular historical sources who wrote near or around the time of Jesus to see what records in fact are available. 1. We have Tacitus. Cornelius Tacitus was a Roman historian who lived circa 56 to 120 AD. He is believed to have been born in France or Gaul into a provincial aristocratic family. He became a senator, a consul, and eventually governor of Asia. Tacitus wrote at least four historic treaties around 115 AD. He published annals in which he explicitly states that Nero prosecuted the Christians in order to draw attention away from himself for Rome's devastating fire of 64 AD. In that context, he mentions Christus, who was put to death by Pontius Pilate. Quote, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name has its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of its procurators, Pontius Pilate, 
and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea the first source of the evil but even in Rome where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular unquote. two we have Pliny the Younger Pliny the Younger was the Roman governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor in one of his letters dated around AD 112 he asked Trajan's advice about the appropriate way to conduct legal proceedings against those accused of being Christians. Pliny says that he needed to consult the emperor about this issue because a great multitude of every age, class, and sex stood accused of Christianity. At one point in his letter, Pliny relates some of the information he has learned about these Christians. Quote, they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by solemn oath not to any wicked deeds but never to commit any fraud theft or adultery never to falsify their word nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food but food of an ordinary and innocent kind." Unquote. 3. There is Flavius Josephus. In Rome, in the year 93 AD, Josephus published his lengthy history of the Jews. While discussing the period in which the Jews of Judea were governed by the Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate, Josephus included the following account. Quote, About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah, and upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things, and a thousand other marvels about him, and the tribe of the Christians so called after him has still to this day not disappeared." Unquote. 4. The Babylonian Talmud The Babylonian Talmud is a collection of Jewish rabbinical writings compiled between approximately A.D. 70 to 500 A.D. The tractate Sanhedrin contains this passage. Quote, Jesus was hanged on Passover Eve. Forty days previously, their herald had cried, quote, He is being led out for stoning because he has practiced sorcery and led Israel astray and enticed them into apostasy. Whoever has anything to say in his defense, let him come and declare it. Unquote. As nothing was brought forward in his defense, he was hanged on Passover Eve. Unquote. Five, we have Lucian of Samosata. Lucian was a second century Greek satirist. In one of his works, he wrote of the early Christians as follows, quote, These deluded creatures, you see, have persuaded themselves that they are immortal and will live forever, which explains the contempt of death and willing self-sacrifice so common among them. It was impressed on them by their lawgiver that from the moment they are converted, deny the gods of Greece, worship the crucified sage, and live after his laws, they are all brothers. They take his instructions completely on faith with the result that they despise all worldly goods and hold them in common ownership. So any adroit and unscrupulous fellow who knows the world has only to get among these simple souls and his fortune is quickly made. He plays with them." Unquote. 6. The Letters from Mara Barsapian a Syrian named Mara Barsapian wrote a curious letter from prison during the first century. The letter was written to his son, Cyprian, to encourage him to follow the example of various esteemed teachers of past ages. This letter is listed as a Syriac manuscript number 14,658 in the British Museum. His father reminded him, quote, What advantage did the Athenians gain from putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came upon them as a judgment for their crime. What advantage did men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger. The Samians were overwhelmed by the sea. 
the Jews ruined and driven from their land live in complete dispersion but Socrates did not die for good he lived on in the statue of Hera nor did the wise king die for good he lived on the teaching which he had given unquote. 7 Georgius Sincellus in his chronicle from about the year 800 the Byzantine chronicler Georgius Sincellus cites a passage from a book no longer in existence entitled quote, a history of the world unquote, which was written about 220 by the church father Julius Africanus himself an able historian who in turn reports that the Roman historian Thallus who wrote on the history of the ancient Near East tries in the third book of his history a work also no longer in existence to explain away the darkness at the time of Christ's death as due to a solar eclipse quote, on the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness and the rocks were rent by an earthquake and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness Thallus in the third book of his history calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the fourteenth day according to the moon, and the passion of our Savior falls on the day before the Passover. But an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun and it cannot happen at any other time but in the interval between the first day of the new moon and the last day of the old that is at their junction how then should an eclipse be supposed to happen when the moon is almost diametrically opposite the sun let that opinion pass however let it carry the majority with it and let this portent of the world be deemed an eclipse of the sun like others a portent only to the eye Flagon records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar at the full moon there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth, manifestly that one of which we speak. But what has an eclipse in common with an earthquake, the rending of rocks, and the resurrection of the dead, and so great a perturbation throughout the universe? Surely no such event as this is recorded for a long period. But it was a darkness induced by God because the Lord happened then to suffer." Unquote. Finally, 8, we have Celsus. Celsus was a 2nd century Roman author and avid opponent of Christianity. He went to great lengths to disprove the divinity of Jesus, yet never denied his actual existence. Quote, Jesus had come from a village in Judea and was the son of a poor Jewish who gained her living by the work of her hands. His mother had been turned out by her husband, who was a carpenter by trade, and being convicted of adultery with a Roman soldier named Panthera, being thus driven away by her husband, and wandering about in disgrace, she gave birth to Jesus, unquote. Quote, if anyone predicted to us that the Son of God was to visit mankind, he was one of our prophets, and the prophet of our God. John, who baptized Jesus, was a Jew, unquote. Quote, Jesus, on account of his poverty, was hired out to go to Egypt. While there, he acquired certain magical powers. He returned home highly elated at possessing these powers, and on the strength of them gave himself out to be a god. It was by means of sorcery that he was able to accomplish the wonders which he performed. Let us believe that these cures, or the resurrection, or the feeding of a multitude with a few loaves, these are nothing more than the tricks of jugglers. It is by the names of certain demons and the use of incantations that the Christians appear to be possessed of these miraculous powers. Quote. Quote, Jesus gathered around him ten or eleven persons of notorious character, tax collectors, sailors, and fishermen. He was deserted and delivered up by those who had been his associates, who had him for their teacher, and who believed he was the Savior and Son of the greatest God those who were his associates while alive who listened to his voice and enjoyed his instructions as their teacher on seeing him subjected to punishment and death neither died with him for him but denied that they were even his disciples lest they die with him unquote. Quote, one who was a god could neither flee nor be led away a prisoner what great deeds did jesus perform as god did he put his enemies to shame or bring an end to what was designed against him no calamity happened even to him who condemned him. Why does he not give some manifestation of his divinity and free himself from this reproach and take vengeance upon those who insult both him and his father? Unquote. 
Next, let us dovetail with a discussion of number one, source documents. While it is interesting to note how favorable these admittedly secular sources we just listed are to Christianity, let us now focus our study on an internal study of the veracity of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. As I said in an earlier episode entitled, The Bible, A Message from God to Man, I detailed the various textual, archaeological, prophetical proofs, as well as the evidence of changed lives which give veracity to the Bible. During the chapter on prophetical evidences, I mentioned the evidence of the prophecy with regard to the Messiah. When we open the Bible, we quickly discover that the eventuality of a Messiah was made necessary when Adam and Eve fell from the perfection and covering of God's grace bestowed at creation. From the moment Adam and Eve were separated from God by sin, once the separation was complete, reconciliation could only be accomplished through the propitiatory sacrifice and death of one who was perfect and sinless on behalf of those separated. Thus, from the fall forward, the stage was set for the one called Messiah who could fulfill this role. The very word Messiah simply means anointed one, messianic prince, or one who is a savior of his people. The Old Testament is ripe from Genesis to Malachi with the belief in and the expectation of a Messiah. Though the Old and New Testaments are inextricably linked, Many people mistakenly believe that Judaism is a distinct and different system from that of Christianity. However, rightly understood, Judaism is the bud, while Christianity is the flower which grows from that bud. The Old Testament anticipates the New, and the New Testament fulfills the Old. While man lives in the moment, God lives in eternity, outside of time itself. He knows the beginning because he was before time began. He knows the end because he is at the end, even though with God there is no end. From one end until the other and in between, God knows all things. From this perspective, if God wanted to communicate to man, there is no better way to demonstrate his infinite knowledge and control than to predict future events to his creation. God did this in his written word, the Bible, which was inspired to the various writers. Since the Messiah was the main anticipated event of human history, we should expect to find heavy emphasis on the subject within the Bible. As it turns out, upon doing an inventory of the Bible regarding this subject, we find that there are an estimated 300 plus passages and or references which predict some aspect of the Messiah. Following are 48 passages from the Old Testament which make reference to the Messiah. As we review these passages which predict the Messiah, keep the following in mind. 1. Almost the entire Old Testament including the following messianic prophecies can be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947 and are believed to have been placed in that cave around 68 AD where they were later found. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been dated and are believed to have been originally written between 100 and 125 BC, that's before Christ. 2. The Septuagint which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament was begun around 250 BC. The Septuagint contains all of the Old Testament, including the following Messianic prophecies. If the work of the Septuagint began around 250 BC, then logic dictates that the source material for this translation was in existence and well established long before 250 BC. 3. As we review the following Messianic prophecies, ask yourself the following questions. A. What are the odds that any one human would be able to conform their lives, including their birth and death, to the specific details of the 48 prophecies, much less 300? B. Looking throughout all of human history from beginning until present, is there any person who singularly fulfills all of these prophecies? The Old Testament prophecies are as follows. 1. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. 
Micah chapter 5 verse 2 2 his birth would be accompanied with great sorrow and suffering Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15 3 a messenger would prepare the way Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 through 5 4 the Messiah would be preceded by Elijah Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 5 the Messiah would be born of a virgin Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 6 the Messiah would come from the line of Abraham Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 and Genesis chapter 22 verse 18 7 Messiah would come from the line of Isaac Genesis chapter 17 verse 19 and Genesis 21 verse 12 8 Messiah would be a descendant of Jacob numbers chapter 24 verse 17 9 Messiah would be of the line of Jesse Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 10 Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 11 Messiah would be heir to King David's throne second Samuel chapter 7 verse 12 and 13 and Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 12 Messiah would be called Emmanuel Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 13 Messiah would be called out of Egypt Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 14 Messiah would be called a Nazarene Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 15 Messiah would be presented gifts Psalm chapter 72 verse 10 Isaiah chapter 60 verse 6 16 a massacre of children would occur at his birthplace Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15 17 he would be rejected by his own people Psalm 69 verse 8 Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 18 Messiah would speak in parables Psalm chapter 78 verses 2 through 4 and Isaiah chapter 6 verses 9 through 12 19 Messiah would be a prophet Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 20 Messiah would be declared the Son of God Psalm chapter 2 verse 7 21 Messiah would bring light to Galilee Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 22 Messiah would enter the temple Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 23 Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a donkey Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 24 Messiah would heal the brokenhearted Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2 25 Messiah would be praised by little children Psalm 8 verse 2 26 Messiah would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek Psalm 110 verse 4 27 Messiah would be betrayed by a friend Psalm chapter 41 verse 9 and Zechariah chapter 11 verses 12 and 13 28 Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver Zechariah chapter 11 verse 12 29 the money involved would be thrown down in the house of God Zechariah chapter 11 verse 13 30 the purchase price of his betrayal would be used to buy a potter's field Zechariah chapter 11 verses 12 and 13 31 Messiah would be forsaken by his followers Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7 32 Messiah would be accused by false witnesses Psalm chapter 35 verse 11 33 Messiah would be silent before his accusers Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 34 Messiah would be spat upon and mocked Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 35 Messiah would be hated without cause Psalm chapter 35 verse 19 and Psalm 69 verse 4 36 Messiah would fall under the cross Psalm 109 verse 24 37 Messiah would be crucified with criminals Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 38 Messiah's friends would stand afar off Psalm chapter 38 verse 11 39 Messiah would suffer thirst Psalm 69 verse 21 40 Messiah would be given vinegar to drink Isaiah chapter 69 verse 21 41 his hands and feet would be pierced Psalm 22 
verse 16, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. 42, they would gamble for his garments, Psalm chapter 22, verse 18. 43, Messiah's bones would not be broken, Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, and Psalm 34, verse 20. 44, Messiah's side would be pierced, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. 45, Messiah's heart would be broken, Psalm chapter 34, verse 20. 46, Messiah would cry that God had forsaken him, Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. 47, there would be darkness over the land, Amos chapter 8, verse 9. And finally, 48, Messiah would be buried with the rich, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. Now that we have identified the above 48 of some 300 plus prophecies regarding Messiah, let us answer the questions we asked earlier. A. What are the odds that any one human would be able to conform their lives, including their birth and death, to the specific details of the 48 prophecies listed above, much less 300 plus? Answer. Well, let me introduce you to a man named Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner was the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College until 1953, the chairman of the Science Division at Westmount College, 1953-57, to professor emeritus of science at Westmount College, professor emeritus of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena City College, professor Stoner published a book in 1963 entitled Science Speaks. In his book Science Speaks, Professor Stoner determines the mathematical probability of one man fulfilling just eight of the above prophecies from the Old Testament to qualify as Messiah to be one in ten to the seventeenth power. Professor Stoner uses the following analogy to provide a tangible perspective which correlates to the figure 1 in 10 to the 17th power. In his analogy, he states that if we took 1 in 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and laid them over the state of Texas, they would cover the state of Texas 2 feet deep. Now, mark one of those silver dollars stir the entire mass of silver dollars thoroughly, blindfold a person, and tell that person that they can travel as far as they want, but they must pick up one and only one silver dollar and say that it is the one marked. What chance would they then have of picking up the right one? It would be the exact same odds of anyone fulfilling just eight of the messianic prophecies by chance alone. In the above case, we are only considering eight prophecies. Professor Stoner goes on in his book to consider the possibility of any one person fulfilling 48 of the prophecies by chance. Here, the odds jump to 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Again, Professor Stoner uses another analogy to provide a tangible perspective which correlates to the figure 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Professor Stoner suggests that if we use an electron, which is the smallest object we know of, in fact one electron is so small it would take 2.5 times 10 to the 15th power, or 250 quadrillion electrons laid side by side, single file, just to measure one inch long. If you were to count each electron and you were able to count 250 of them each minute and you wouldn't count non-stop day and night, it would take you 19 million years to count just that one inch of electrons. If further you had a cubic inch of these electrons, and we counted them at the same rate as before, it would take you 19 million times 19 million times 19 million, or 6.9 times 10 to the 21st power, or 690 sextillion years to count that cubic inch of electrons. Now, as before, 
mark one electron, stir thoroughly, blindfold yourself, and select the marked electron on the first try. This would now be the same odds of anyone fulfilling 48 of the messianic prophecies by chance alone. Second question. B. Looking throughout all of human history from beginning until present, is there any person who singularly fulfilled all of these prophecies? Answer. In doing a survey of human history from beginning until present, there is only one person who has historically filled all 300 prophecies. He is Yeshua HaMashiach, also known as Jesus of Nazareth. Why is any of this important? Why spend so much time listing 48 prophecies about the Messiah? Well, because at some point, hopefully, it has become glaringly obvious that when the odds reach these kinds of extremes, we are no longer talking about random chance or luck. Instead, what we are seeing is truth and reality from someone outside of time who knows the beginning and the end and has chosen to reveal those details to us so that we might experience trust and faith in the one responsible God. By virtue of having seen at least 48 of these prophecies having been fulfilled with precision, we can confidently go on to have full faith and complete assurance that there are other messianic prophecies which have or will be fulfilled such as 1. Messiah would be resurrected. Psalms chapter 16 verse 10. 2. 